All right, so we've got a lot of material to hit this evening, so we're going to get right into it. Isaiah chapter 3, um, you notice when it starts, it starts with this conjunction, for behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts has taken away from Jerusalem, and that's the way it starts because, you know, originally when the Bible was recorded, there wasn't chapter divisions, so um, it, it was all written um, as like an entire book. But the chapter divisions, in many cases, I mean, I think in all cases, they make, they make sense where they've been chosen to be divided. And this one definitely makes sense. If you remember from last week, we were, we were looking at a lot of prophetic scriptures in Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2 is full of a lot of prophecy. Um, and when we transition to chapter number 3 at this point, it, there's actually a really good transitioning here where we're kind of steering away from all that prophecy. And you know, as I mentioned before, you know, especially Old Testament prophecy, there's many places where you can have a dual prophecy, where you can have, um, you know, problematic times, perilous times that are going to be coming up in the short term, where there's going to be some uh, persecution, where God's going to bring judgment on the people that, like, literally at the time coming very shortly, as well as then also prophesying of a greater time of tribulation or of other things, other events happening in the future. So, um, you, you know, it's, it's important just to kind of keep that in mind as you get, you know, don't get too hung up on, on you know, these, these bits of prophecy that we kind of read and then it goes back into say, well, how can they both be talking about this? And, you know, it's, it's not a big deal. I mean, really, it's, it's not. It's, it's the way that the Bible works. And you, the more you read it, you just realize that, um, that that's how God prophesies. That's how God has given his word. And that's one of the amazing things about God's word is that not only is it applicable for the time present, we could still go back to this and, and receive a lot of information about future events as well. So um, anyhow, when we get started here, that's why we get started in verse number one. Uh, the Bible reads, For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, doth take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay and the staff, the whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water. We're going to keep reading here in a minute, but what we're going to see all in, in total, kind of to sum up chapter three, before we get into all of the details, is I, I've subtitled this sermon, Marks of a Cursed Nation. And we've seen, you know, chapters one and two did not start off positive at all. They were both negative. They're both just hard preaching on Judah and Jerusalem. You know, God's people have really let things slip and slide. And they're not in a good position with the Lord right now. And that's why Isaiah is preaching judgment against his people. And, you know, in chapter one, he was saying, he referenced Sodom and Gomorrah. And now it's coming up again in chapter 3 as well. And, you know, obviously they're involved, just the people in general are involved in some really wicked sin, even though the leadership really is doing a pretty good job. Overall, the, the, the reign of the kings during which Isaiah is preaching are, are known to be good kings, all but one. But we're not even to that king yet in this uh, chronology of Isaiah's preaching. So... It's interesting how that can be, but it, that's the way it is. And it's, you know, I think the answer is that politics isn't the answer. You know, leaders can do a lot to help a nation, but at the end of the day, God's still going to bring judgment. If you've got a bunch of wicked people and one righteous leader, you know, no one wants to follow, they're not going to be leading very long, and they're not going to be, uh, you know, God's still going to bring his judgment on the whole of the people. But... Um, what we're seeing here, too, is now that things are going to be, like, more turned upside down. And as we get into this, we'll, you'll see that more and more. So as a result of this, because we saw, we kind of finish up chapter 2 with people, you know, when God's really going to bring forth his wrath and his judgment, people are going to be hiding in the caves and dens of the rocks and saying, fall on us, and, the, and that type of imagery, right? And finally getting rid of their, their idols. But this is, con so it's continuing along the same vein of, like, this judgment coming but for behold, the Lord's, Lord's going to take away uh, the stay in the staff, the whole uh, stay of bread and the whole stay of water. So they've been fed, watered, you know, basically nourished without any problems. And now God's saying, you know what, I'm going to take that away. The mighty man and the man of war. So all these things that we're listing off in, the, in the, these first three verses, it says God's going to take them away. So God's going to take away the mighty man. God's going to take away the man of war. God's going to take away the judge, the prophet, the prudent, the ancient the captain of 50, the honorable man, and the counselor, and the cunning artificer, and the eloquent order. These are all marks of 
a nation who is succeeding, a nation who's doing well, when you have a nation, you know, full of mighty men and judges and prophets and prudence, and you've got old men with wisdom and captains and people are honorable and counselors and people able to make just nice craft with their hands, you know, cunning artificers, eloquent orders, orders good speakers, all these things, you know, God's saying, you know, I'm going to take all that stuff away from you. All that stuff is going to be gone. And, you know, as I mentioned before, when, when nations are really thriving and get into a, a very prosperous time, all of these things should be abounding. You're going to be very strong. You're going to have might. You're going to have wisdom and honor. And all of these things are going to be the virtues of the land. And, you know, we're going to be applying this to our nation, but this is cyclical in the sense that this happens over and over and over again with many nations all throughout history. And especially with nations who are going to claim the Lord, they end up being blessed tremendously, but then always end up devolving and, and degrading and, and turning into a decadent place and, and, you know, end up facing destruction as a result. It's just, I mean, it's just kind of the, the sinful nature of man that ends up turning that way. Now, in every generation, though, there's always people who will serve the Lord and will stand up regardless of the times, regardless of where you're at in any particular cycle. There's always people who are going to stand firm and stand for the Lord. So, uh, you know, praise God for them. It's just a matter of how m many of the people are being swayed when God's going to end up bringing his destruction on an entire nation. In verse number four, so he's taking away all these people where it makes sense. It all fits. It's a rightful place to have all these people in these positions when things are going well. And then he says in verse 4, And I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them. This is the first thing that the Bible is mentioning here that's just, it's not right. Society's not designed, you shouldn't have a, a society that's, that's being run by children. That babes are ruling over them. Why? Because children need to grow and mature. Because they don't have the wisdom that comes with age and experience. No matter how bright and how smart young people may be, they're still lacking in wisdom, in knowledge, especially to rule a people. You can be very fervent and have a lot of zeal and have a lot of drive and, and have ideals, but at the end of the day, it's not a wise idea to have children being in places of, rule, of, of leadership and ruling. This is why that, you know, in, in our current government that they have age limits of like you have to at least be this old to be in, hold this position of leadership, right? So the, the lesser responsibility and, and, and level of leadership it is, the, you know, the, the lower the requirement goes. But the higher the office goes, man, you need to have someone with, with uh, you know, enough years behind them and enough maturity to be able to make wise choices. And when you don't have that, you're going to have lots and lots of problems. So one of the ways you can identify a cursed nation is when you say, you know, children are their princes. Princes are the rulers. They're the ones in charge. They're the ones making the rules. I mean, think about it in, in some of the most basic, um, the basic concept of like at home. Right? Of course you need a mom and dad ruling the house, not the kids. And we have a lot of troubled homes where, unfortunately, because the parents aren't the rulers of their home, because they're not laying down the law, because they're not in charge, it turns out that the children are the ones in charge, where the children are able to throw a fit, and mom and dad are just going to give in because... Well, I don't want to deal with this. Oh, this is too hard. This is too difficult. I don't have time for this, so I'm just going to give them whatever they're crying about. And you know when you do that? When you give in to kids, when you know it's not right, when they don't deserve it or whatever, you're, having, you're letting the child rule over you. When the child dictates what they're going to do and they're contradicting what you're saying that they need to do and you give in to that, you're letting them rule. And, and that is a shame. That is a shame. And that is one of the reasons why you see so many spoiled brats and unruly children in this world today is because the parents 
don't want to take it on themselves to get up and discipline their children, to stop what they're doing. Yes, it's difficult. I know it's not easy. I know it's hard. But look, it's important. You have to discipline your children. You can't just let them run all over you. You need to be the one in charge. God made you in charge. Mom, dad, whatever, at home, you're in charge. Dad is at the height of the authority in the home, but you know what? Underneath that is mom. And when dad's out working all day, guess what, moms? You need to be pushing, punishing the children. Don't just say, oh, well, dad's going to punish you when he gets home. Now, that ought to be reserved. And that still should be a thing. Dad's going to punish you. That should be something that, the, that ought to put the fear of God in your children's eyes. You don't want dad punishing you. But you know what, moms, that doesn't mean it's not your place. It's actually more important for you to be doing it. And here, here's what happens. You know what happens when you don't discipline your children? They don't respect you. They don't respect you at all. They're not going to listen to anything you have to say when you can't lay down the rule and the authority in your house. And when they challenge your authority, you just give in and let them get away with it. No respect whatsoever. And then you make it that much harder to try to regain control and regain respect. But you know what? Don't give up. If you've given in sometimes, if you've, if you've allowed things to happen that you know shouldn't happen and you didn't step in and do what you're supposed to do, start now. It's never too late to start unless your kids are already grown and out. I mean, they're, once they're gone, they're gone. But you got kids living in your home, it's never too late to start. And let them know you mean business. It's a shame. I mean, it's, that's, that's a curse when children are ruling over you, when children are the princes and babes rule over them. Obviously, we're talking about nation here, but you can apply that in, in many areas of life here because children are not supposed to be the rulers. They're supposed to be learning. They're supposed to be um, maturing and growing. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, you could turn there if you'd like, it's basically describing something very similar, uh, especially as we continue to read Isaiah. This is just the first mark of, of, of a cursed nation is when the children are, are the princes. But Ecclesiastes 10 has another passage of scripture that talks about something very similar, about things just being kind of backwards and, and not the way that they ought to be. Verse number 5, Ecclesiastes 10 reads, There is an evil which I have seen under the sun as an error which proceedeth from the ruler. Folly is set in great dignity. So it's saying folly is foolishness, Right? We're saying when folly is just set in great dignity, when people are giving respect and reverence unto foolishness, that's an error. That's wrong. That's not the way things ought to be. It says, and the rich sit in low place. I have seen servants upon horses and princes walking as servants upon the earth. Everything is just upside down. Now, this isn't... When the Bible is referring to, you know, the kings and the princes and all this stuff, the Bible defines for itself a righteous king and a righteous ruler. You know, too many people, I think, look at these passages and go, oh, well, what do you mean when the rich, you know, it's because it's talking about the people who should be in their positions righteously and doing what they're supposed to be doing, not just total crooks and everything else. Because it's like, well, who cares if the crook is is, you know, leading the horse or whatever and not sitting on the horse. That doesn't matter because he's not talking about the crooks. He's talking about people who should have been elevated to positions because they've proven themselves people of integrity and people of honor and people have been chosen to lead people because they have been very good, because they have been worthy of being honored and having that position and they should be the ones then leading the charge. They should be the ones riding on the horses. They should be the ones you know, doing these things. That's what the Bible is referring to when it's talking about these types of people and being the ones in dignity. Like when you read the judges, the judges are people who God have raised up, the judges of the earth, the, you know, the, the Samsons and Jephthahs and all these other people have risen up and risen to the occasion and God has blessed them to do these great things and great works and be these great deliverers. Well, you know what? They're, deser they're worthy of the respect and honor and they ought to be the ones not walking as servants upon the earth, but walking as princes upon the earth. And he's saying this is, this is, this is backwards. It's an error. It's not right when, when you have things backwards. When you have people who ought to be very well respected, now all of a sudden they're just, you know, it's, it's like Job. 
You know, when Job lost everything, now all of a sudden his friends come, and they're telling him, oh, you did all the sin and everything else. He didn't do anything wrong. Yet everyone came and, and slandered his name then and gave him, gave him a, a, bad, a bad name when they ought to have respected him still. Even though all these bad things happened to him. Why? Because he wasn't an unrighteous man. Because he was worthy of the honor. Jump down to verse number 16. The Bible says, Woe to thee, O land, when thy king is a child and thy princes eat in the morning. You say, why eat in the morning? What's wrong with that? Here's the key. Look at the next verse. The Bible says, Blessed art thou, O land, when thy, ki excuse me, when thy king is the son of nobles, and thy princes eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. So the whole point of saying when, you know, when, the, when the prince is you're saying, Oh, man, you're woe unto the land when your princes eat in the morning. It's because they're not like working. They're just eating because they can and they just have all this luxury and riches. And it's like, Oh, we're going to eat in the morning. We're going to eat in the afternoon. We're going to eat, you know, like we're just going to eat all this time. But they're not eating for strength. They're just eating because they just really enjoy eating. And they're given more to gluttony than they are to actually working and doing something, which is what you would need that energy for to begin with. So you ought to have a prince or a ruler that eats because they need to eat, because they're working so hard, because they're doing things, because they're getting things done, because they're, they're doing what they ought to be doing and not just because they're partying up and living it up because they just have all this money and all these riches and because they're a ruler and everything else, right? Like Ahasuerus who's just throwing these big parties and just, oh yeah, I want to just drink wine and, you know, and just like, and it's what's going on for six months. I mean, it's one thing to have a celebration and a party for a day or two or whatever, you know, but like six months, come on, you got, you got more important things to do. And, you know, woe to the land when thy king is a child. So this is, this is a concept that we find throughout Scripture. And actually, a little bit later, we're going to be turning to Jeremiah as well, because Jeremiah, it's, it's just amazing how similar, even though they are in different time periods, somewhat close together, but, but Isaiah and Jeremiah are not preached in overlapping time periods. I, Jeremiah is later than Isaiah is, yet the condition of the people still seems to be very, very similar. So we're going to be comparing those Scriptures as well. Um, back in Isaiah chapter 3, verse number 5, the Bible reads, And the people shall be oppressed, everyone by another, and everyone by his neighbor. The child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient, and the base against the honorable. So again, we're seeing things backwards. We're seeing children not having any respect and behaving proudly against the ancient, against the older people. They have no respect whatsoever for their elders. And you know what? That's the way that kids are today, by and large, in this world. They don't care at all that they're speaking to an elder that they ought to be respecting and showing reverence to because they're younger and the, the elder is older and that that's the right thing to do and they ought to be giving, you know, using discretion and showing, hey, this person's been around a lot longer than I have. I'm not going to mouth off to him. I'm not just going to be a smart aleck and think I know everything with my proud lips and proud look and just start backlashing all these, these older people. It's wicked. It's not right. We ought not to have a society where the children are going around and behaving this way. It's a curse from God when the children behave that way, but you know what? It's controllable by the parents parenting their children right. And I don't care how the world is going. You ought to take it upon yourself to raise your children right that God gave you. It's your, your responsibility. And I don't care how hard you say it is, because that's your responsibility to bear. The Bible says in verse number six, when a man, or it says they're in the base against the honorable too. So like, you know, the, the people who are just, you know, the derelicts, the, 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 just the really low people in a society that they're just behaving themselves proudly against the honorable, against people who are actually walking uprightly. It's wrong. And, and, you know, in our weird, perverted society where the morality just keeps going down the tubes, that's what's happening. You've got filthy perverts behaving proudly against people who have integrity, against people who actually care about the laws of the Lord or against even just basic morality that are not perverts. And you have the perverts just... just behaving proudly against those that would be honorable. 
and it's disgusting. And you know what we see? We see those that are supposed to be holding the guard as being honorable, caving in to the base. And that's not helping anybody. And you think that's helping your kids? We need more people with spines and backbones not to back down to the base of this earth. Verse number six, when a man shall take hold of his brother of the house of his father, saying, Thou hast clothing, be thou our ruler, and let this ruin be under thy hand. So this is what, you know, it's being prophesied. If a man's just going to come to his, to his brother, right, just saying, well, look, you have clothing, so be our ruler. Like, they're looking for someone to lead them, and the mark, the, the bar has fallen so low, it's just like, hey, at least you've got some clothing, so why don't you be our, why don't you inherit this big mess that we have right now and be the ruler over it? That's what he says. Let this ruin be under thy hand. I mean, at least you have something to show for it. You must be doing something right. In that day shall he swear, saying, I will not be an healer, for in my house is neither bread nor clothing. Make me not a ruler of the people. He's saying, I don't have anything either. So we were going to someone looking like, oh, man, you got this stuff. Why don't you be a No, I don't have anything. I've got nothing to show. I can't be a healer. And the thinking here is because you go to someone to try to help fix a problem that doesn't have the problem themselves. Because obviously if they don't have a problem. See, that's why you don't go to people for marriage advice that have been divorced five times. They don't know what they're doing. They've been divorced five times. They can say, oh, but I've learned from my... Have you? Because I don't really think you have. I'm not married, no. I've been divorced five times, but... I'll tell you what, if I ever get married again, then it's going to be for, yeah, right. Don't take advice from those people. Take advice from the people who have been married for 50 years. Because obviously they made it through it. Because everybody goes through problems. Everyone has hardships, but you know what? The couples that stay together for a lifetime, that's who we ought to be going to, to say, hey, give me some counsel, give me some wisdom. And that's what they're trying to say here. They're just looking for somebody to say, hey, look, you know, there's this great dearth on the land now, and no one has anything. We've all come to poverty because of all the stupid sins that everyone is getting themselves into. And now they're saying, well, we need someone to lead us. And they try to find someone. He's like, well, I can't do it either. I don't have anything. Because there's nobody with wisdom among them. Look at verse number 8. The Bible says, for Jerusalem is ruined, and Judah is fallen. And it tells us why here. Because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his glory. When a people's tongue and their doings are against the Lord, judgment's coming. Especially when they're his people. You say there's a lot of people in the world whose, whose doings are against the Lord. Yeah, but you know what? The, the nation that's supposed to be the people of the Lord, he's going to chasten them and discipline them severely. If people aren't even claiming the name of the Lord, they're not going to get judged the same way as the people who are claiming the name of the Lord and are still doing wickedly and are doing everything contrary to the Lord. And if you are going to look at the character of our country as a whole right now, from the outside looking in, if you are just an external spectator in the United States of America, what impression are you going to get of this country that we live in right now? Leadership's a joke. The whole government is just cor stinking corrupt to the core. And that's supposed to be a reflection on, on this great democracy that we have and all these people voting and stuff. You know what? There are a lot of weird people just voting for all kinds of wicked people because they're blind and ignorant and stupid. Yeah, they're stupid. You're going around voting for these wicked people. You're stupid. Open up your eyes. You keep on getting worse and worse and worse choices. They're not going to change anything. They're just going to keep making things worse and worse and worse. I'm not even, I don't even choose to be part of that system. Because there's, there's, it's a no-win situation. Verse number 9, the Bible reads, The show of their countenance doth witness against them. So it's the look on their face. That's what the show of their countenance is. The looks on their face even witness against them. 
and they declare their sin as Sodom, they hide it not. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. And again, when you have a nation that gets so bad that they have no more shame for their wicked, abominable sins that they do, judgment is just around the corner. I mean, judgment's coming. I don't see how the United States is not going to be judged very, very soon. I don't see how it could happen because the scripture says over and over and over again what happens to this people. I mean, all of their doings, their tongue of being against the Lord and declaring their sin as Sodom, says they hide it not. I'm going to read for you from Philippians chapter 3. Turn, if you would, to, um, turn if you would to Jeremiah chapter 6. Philippians 3.17 says, Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as you have us for an ensample, for many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. And you know who these people are today? It's the homos. Because that's who declares their sin as Sodom. Sodom declared their sin. They had no, it was not, it was not hidden. They weren't in the closet. In fact, they were out of the closet. They were out on the streets, and they were banging on Lot's door trying to get the new men that showed up in town to defile them. Because when, when things get out of control and when, and when nations are just given over to filth and perversion and, and just disgusting abominations, judgment's coming. And it ends up turning into a place like Sodom, like Gomorrah, where these people who are so given over to their fornication and their lusts, they don't even care anymore. They don't even hide it. You know, there was a day not that long ago in this country where it used to be a total and utter shame on a family to have a homo relative, yeah. to have a, fa a family member. You know, they would be shunned. They'd be like, you know, you talk to the parents. They'd be like, I don't know what I did wrong. I can't believe they're like this. You know, I, I don't have anything to do with them. And, and it was a shame and an embarrassment, and you don't even want to talk about it because they're so filthy and abominable, and everybody knew it, and everybody realized it, but now the world's gone crazy. And you know, that's the way things ought to be. Yeah, get them back in the stinking closet. We don't want them walking around declaring their sin and not hiding it. I mean, if you're going to do something so filthy and abominable, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. But these people are so far gone that they think it's great. And on top of that, they want to shove it down your throat, shove it down my throat, and tell you how great it is and force you to accept it. And if you don't, and if you say anything about it, they're going to try to ruin your life. Which they wouldn't be able to do if people who are upright would make a stand against it and not be so stinking fearful for their own safety and their own life and their own prosperity and their own job and everything else. You know what? What's right is right and what's wrong is wrong. And wicked people ought to be called out as being wicked. And we should not tolerate abominable filth and perversion ever. Amen. Ever. The Bible talks about these people. These people of Sodom. They declare their sin like Sodom. Whose end is destruction. The God is in their belly. And the glory is in their shame. Why do you think they have pride events? They're glorying in their shame, in their filth, in their, their abominable acts. They just think it's great. They want to publicize it and broadcast it for everybody to get before the eyes of your little children and defile their minds with their filth. These are the types of people like 1 Timothy chapter 4 talks about. In verse number 1, the Bible reads, now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter, day, latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. The only way that a person is going to get to the point of being involved in some of the most vile acts that you can do between two people is if your conscience is and, and then be and then be glorying in that 
and then be declaring that publicly? The only way is if your conscience is seared with a hot iron. These people have no conscience that are out there broadcasting their wickedness and abominable filth. When they declare their sin, their conscience is seared. Now, any normal person, you think about, I would never be able to think about two dudes or two ladies, you know, committing the acts that these people commit because it's revolting and it's going to make you want to vomit even thinking about it. I don't even like the words coming out of my mouth because it's so filthy. But the only people that can even do these things is because their conscience has been seared. They're going to go out, broadcast it, do this wicked filth, and, and glory in it and say, yeah, I'm doing that. Because they have no conscience. Because nothing's wrong to them. This is exactly the reason why we warn you about these filthy fags that they're out after your kids. Because they're, oh, well, just because they like being with other men, what, that doesn't mean they like kids. Look, when, the, when their, their conscience is seared, and they're already going to do just bizarre things with, between themselves, what's to stop them from going after kids and animals and anything else that moves? Because they have no conscience. They have no limitation. Because the natural boundary that God has given all of us, they've crossed that boundary. They've been given over to that reprobate mind. There's nothing left to stop them. See, all the normal people of the world don't even consider these acts against the most vulnerable people in our world or against animals or anything of the sort because it's bizarre and disgusting. And you have that boundary because you have a conscience. Because even without reading the Bible, God has given you a conscience to let you know, hey, this isn't right. I don't think this is right. The conscience given by God to help guide you. Just through intuition and feeling, God lets you know, yeah, that's not right. Let alone it being actually spelled out so clearly in Scripture. But when that conscience is seared, you become a psychopath. And you're, you are capable of anything. Watch out for these people. These are not, this is not to be messed with and toyed with and tolerated. Definitely not tolerated. I am intolerant today. Intolerant. I am not tolerant of, of reprobate perverts. Not for a second. In case you were wondering and, and had any doubt where I stand on this issue. Jeremiah chapter 6, look at verse number 13. The Bible reads, from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. And you know, this is exactly what was going on in Sodom as well. They've got, they've got riches and abundance of idleness, and then it's getting to covetousness, and nothing's ever good enough for them, and they start going after the strange flesh and, and just continue on that downward spiral. From the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness, and from the prophet, even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they, look at this, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Question. They committed abomination, were they even ashamed? Think about it. If, if you were to commit an abomination, not every sin in Scripture is referred to as an abomination. Read the sins. It's not just Sodom either. It's, you know, read the sins that are talking about abominations, abominable things. And ask yourself, would I be ashamed if I even did something like that? Even if no one knew about it. I hope so. I mean, I, <laughs> no, I would be ashamed. You do something that's abomination, would you even be ashamed? It says, were they ashamed when they committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore, they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. When people, when it gets to that point, God's just saying, you know what? They're going to fall. When, when you can't even blush over abominations that you do, it's too late. It's done. 
Verse 16, thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where is a good way and walk therein and you shall find rest for your souls. And this is what I'm preaching to you tonight. Hey, we need to seek out the old paths, the old ways, the right way of doing things. Not all this new progressive ways of thinking and, and oh, how smart we are now and, and we're looking at people. We need to be so loving and accepting and tolerant of all this wickedness and filth. No, we need to go back to the old paths. We need to go back to the old ways. They had it right. But they said, we will not walk therein. And unfortunately, if people have that attitude today too, not much help can be done. We will not walk therein. Also, I, look at, also I said, watchmen over you. Saying, hearken to the sound of the trumpet. He said, I sent people to warn you. They were watching for your souls. They're watching for you. They're trying to protect you. They're looking out for you and saying, listen, the trumpet's sounding. There's war coming. The people are going to come. We're going to be destroyed. Hey, wake up. Pay attention. The sodomites are getting stronger and stronger. We need, we need to stop this thing. We need to stop the perverts. We need to stop this cancel culture. We need to stop it. Now, and stop giving way to the wicked people. But you know what? People don't want to listen. You deserve what you get. I don't want to see it that way. That's why I'm up here screaming and yelling and pounding, because I don't want to see it that way. Would to God we could have a thousand people sitting here with me today. Verse 17, also I said, watchmen over you, saying, hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not hearken. Look, we don't want to walk that way. We don't want to listen. Therefore, hear ye nations, and know, congregation, what is among them. Hear, O earth, behold, I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not hearkened unto my words, nor to my law, but rejected it. It's not a hard choice. Flip over to chapter 8. We see almost the same thing. I'm going to try to get through this one a little bit quicker because there's more things I want to get to. Verse 5, chapter 8. Why then is this people of Jerusalem sitting back by a perpetual backsliding? It's just, it just doesn't end. I mean, when people backslide, hopefully you catch yourself and go, wait, no, I need to go back forward. This is just a perpetual backsliding. It's getting worse and worse and worse. They hold fast deceit. They refuse to return. I hearkened and heard but they spake not aright. No man repented him of his wickedness, saying, what have I done? Everyone turned to his course as the horse rusheth into the battle. Yea, the stork in the heaven knoweth her appointed times, and the turtle and the crane and the swallow observe the time of their coming. But my people know not the judgment of the Lord. He said, my people don't even understand. The animals understand. They get it. They know. But my people are dumber than animals. And they're not even understanding what the judgment of the Lord is. And Christians today are, are so oblivious and blind. We're being judged now actively by God. And it's just the beginning. And I think we've been given space to repent. But the judgment has already come. What do you think the COVID has been? It's a judgment. People being locked in their homes. Not allowed out. All these restrictions, everything going on, people getting sick and dying. It's a judgment of God. And it's only going to get worse. And you can blame it on the politicians. You can blame it on these people. You blame it on these people. You know what? You know who's to blame? It's the wicked Christians that are allowing this world and our country to go down the toilet. Because you've been so loving and accepting of all the filth and perversion, now it's gotten out of control. And now you're wondering, oh, why is all this happening? Because you're being judged of God and you don't even realize it. Everyone thinks they're so good. Oh, we've got all these riches and money and everything else and I'm just fine. And you don't know that you're miserable and poor and blind and naked. Verse number eight, how do you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? How do you even say that? These people think that they're wise. 
They say, hey, we got the law of the Lord with us. That's modern day Christianity. Most certainly in vain made he it. The pen of the scribe is in vain. The wise men are ashamed. They are dismayed and taken. Lo, they have rejected the word of the Lord and what wisdom is in them. Therefore will I give their wives unto others and their fields to them that shall inherit them. For everyone from the least even unto the greatest is given to covetousness. From the prophet even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. For they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people, slightly saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore shall they fall among them that fall. In the time of their visitation they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. I will surely consume them, saith the Lord. There shall be no grapes on the vine, nor figs on the fig tree, and the leaf shall fade, and the thing that I have given them shall pass away from them. Let's go back to Isaiah chapter 3. In Jeremiah 6 and 8 there, God's repeating himself with that same message of, you know, were they ashamed? No, they weren't ashamed. In this message of judgment, Jeremiah's sending the message. Isaiah's sending the message. And the people just don't get it. We need the people to get it. We need to keep doing what's right. We need to keep preaching. We're never going to stop. Never going to give up. But man, oh man, we need to get something to get through to people. I don't know, I don't know what it's going to take. Probably more judgment. Because that's usually what it takes. People realize where we really are. It would be easy if we just had like the reality sunglasses like in They Live. That movie with Rowdy Roddy Piper, right? Where he's, where he's, and you know, if you haven't seen it, I don't recommend watching the movie, but if you know what I'm talking about, he puts on these sunglasses and like there's these aliens that were living among the people, right? And like they were really just ruling the people without the people even realizing it. They were just like kind of not even understanding that they were in bondage to this other, and, you know, and they had this whole plan where I don't even remember the whole plot of the story, but um, there was these special glasses that when you put them on, you can actually see like, oh man, that got, you know, like, like that's, that's an alien. That's not, that's not one of a, you know, it's not an actual human being there. And if we could have glasses like that where you could just see like, no, wait, these people are all like reprobates. They're all just super wicked. Like, wait, I need to put these on and see, oh man, wait, I'm, you know, I thought I was clothed and everything. It turns out I'm naked. It turns out, you know, I need, to, I need to do some serious changing in my life. I thought everything was good. I thought my house was so nice and everything. And you see just like, you're just, everything's moth-eaten and torn. Like, what's the point? We need some truth glasses to get, to get people on track with what's right. Get righteousness back. Judgment back. Isaiah 3, look at verse number 10. The Bible says, Say ye to the righteous that it shall be well with him, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Woe unto the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hand shall be given him. As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. So we already went over the children part. Now we're going to go over the women part. Okay? And again, this isn't, I know that this isn't going to go well. I mean, it will here. But this doesn't go well in the world. But the Bible saying here, you know, as for my people, children are their oppressors and rule, women rule over them. It's not putting that in a good light. When women are ruling over a nation, it's not a good thing according to God. Oh, my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err. Well, wait, who's leading them? Well, the women are ruling over them. They which lead thee cause thee to err, cause you to be in error. And destroy the way of thy paths. God didn't design women to be ruling and in authority over nations. That's not the way he designed it at all. And look, God loves women. I love women. I love femininity and masculinity. Because God designed men to be masculine and women to be feminine. And that's the way he made it. And let's rejoice in his creation that he made men a certain way and he made women a certain way and not try mixing the roles together and not try screwing them up and confounding them and saying, oh, well, I think women should be more like men and I think men should be more like women. No! It's madness. 
and it's another sign of a cursed nation. And we've got a woman vice president. We've got women Supreme Court justices. We've got women all over in places of authority and governors and senators and everything else ruling over the people. And it's not right. And you know, if a Christian read their Bible, they should be able to look around and say, wow, it looks like we're cursed. It looks like we're becoming a cursed nation. Oh no, but everything's so great and I'm going to vote for Mrs. So-and-so. Turn if you would to 1 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to see some more scripture about this. This is far from the only place in the Bible that talks about women being in authority, being wrong. Pastor Burden, you're so misogynistic. You know, I don't care what, what people want to label me as. I just, I love the Bible. I love God's word, and that's what I, that's what I believe. Amen. And you know what sickens me is the people who say they believe God's word, but they don't want to believe all of it. They want to, they want to avoid the uncomfortable parts. They're all happy to claim Jesus, but they don't want to claim anything else. Look, it's all the word of God. All of it, from, from cover to cover. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 9, the Bible reads, In like manner also that women, so this is what women should do, adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shame, facedness, and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly ray, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Look at the next verse. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. It's the word of God saying, I don't allow a woman to teach or to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. This isn't just talking about the husband and wife, by the way. These are positions in the world, in general, that men are supposed to be in authority and leading the way and being the teachers and definitely behind the pulpit in a church. But then he goes on to explain a little bit more. Verse 13, the Bible says, For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression, notwithstanding she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. I said, look, Adam wasn't the one that was deceived. Eve was. Eve was, was, was the one that Satan came and tricked. Now, even giving this reasoning, it reasons to stand that the way that God made men and women, that women are more susceptible to being deceived. And we see that, and that's not... It is what it is, okay? It's not even necessarily a flaw because it's along with being that, that capable of being deceived also has a lot of nurture and, and empathy and sympathy and, and more attributes that are really positive attributes. But because you have those attributes that are really positive, really good, it can also lend itself to be more easily manipulated and deceived. And that's the way that God designed women, but... They're designed that way to be able to do the job that God has designed for women to do. Which is an extremely important job, raising children. Extremely important job. I mean, I, I'm going to get into this soon when we, you know, Mother's Day, I usually preach a Mother's Day sermon, but the job of raising children what, what matters, the thing about this, what matters to you? I try to tell this to people all the time in general and just in, in regular conversation, you know, because people are always commenting on, oh, you have so many kids and this and that, and, you know, oh, I can never do, you know, people always say all kinds of stupid things, all kinds of stupid things. And the reason why is because the priorities, by and large, 
are on money and on things. But I tell them, you know, what is it that really matters in this world? You know what matters to me are people, souls, relationships. That matters so much more than how dirty my car is or whether or not I can have nice furniture or whatever the case may be or how much money we have to go out and do this and do that. It doesn't matter. It means nothing compared to the relationships you have with children, with people. People matter so much. That's what truly matters. People have eternal souls. Everything around you is going to burn up. And women have been given a job of nurturing and raising people that are going to continue on, whose souls are going to continue on forever and having the most, probably the single most impact on a person's life is going to be coming from mom. Outside of our Lord and Savior. Humanly speaking, they're going to have the most impact and influence on a child. Probably even more so than dad. Because you'll be spending so much more time with your children. Nurturing and raising and everything else. No one should be looking down on the role that God gave to women. It ought to be appreciated and respected. It's a shame when people do look down on that job because it is the most important job. That, jo that job, with my children being raised, is so much more valuable than whatever the stupid work that I'm doing when I go off to work. The computers I work on, and these little projects I do, and making job more efficient to make money for the company and all this other stuff that we sell. What is that compared to my children? And how they are raised and how they grow up and what type of character they have. That job's gonna come and go. My children have eternal souls. And people need to be rebuked that want to denigrate that job and that position of a homemaker. Because that is important. And ladies shouldn't start trying to be like men. Try to be like a woman. Let the men be the men. And the men were given the role of the leading and, and getting things done because that's how God designed men to be. God designed men to be stronger physically and emotionally to be stronger, to be less capable of being deceived, to be able to do what's right and just have firmness and to do it. It's a fact of nature. It's the way God made it. I don't care if you disagree with me or not. This is why God made things the way he did. And the scripture says, look, I suffer not a woman to teach, nor do you serve authority over the man, but to be in silence. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34, let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. It's a shame. We were just talking about shame. Let's not declare your shame and glory in your shame by just piping up. Amen, preacher! That was a shame for women to speak in the church. Hey, you want to learn something? Go ask your husband at home. Because that's what God designed. He gave you a husband. And I love how this continues, too. I mean, this just reinforces this teaching. Verse 36, what came the word of God out from you or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. This isn't Paul's opinion. This isn't Paul being some misogynist. These are the words of the Lord. This is what God is saying here. It's the words of the Lord. When you have women and children ruling over you, it's a curse from God. And you know what, men? Don't allow your wife to rule the home. And ladies, don't try ruling the home and usurping the authority over your husband. 
in manipulating your husband to do everything that you want him to do and everything else, let your husband lead. Because that's disgusting when ladies are just always trying to just do everything and, and just, just overpower and be overbearing in the home. It's wicked. It's wrong. It's ungodly. It's not the way that God designed things to be. It reminds me of what, you know, in this story in Jeremiah 44, I'm going to read for you. The Bible says in Jeremiah 44, verse 15, Then all the men which knew that their wives had burned incense unto other gods, and all the women that stood by a great multitude, even all the people that dwelt in the land of Egypt and Pathros, answered Jeremiah, saying, As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. Because Jeremiah is trying to tell him, look, you need to stop worshiping the queen of heaven. You need to stop making these wafers and these cakes under the queen of heaven. Get rid of your idols and serve the Lord. And they're saying, you know what? And this, you know, this word that you said, these wives come up. This word that you said unto us, we're not going to stop doing that. And the men which knew that their wives had burned incense, instead of rebuking their wives, saying, you're wrong. These henpecked husbands are just going to go ahead and, and defend their wives for getting in all kinds of wickedness. When you know what, man, you're supposed to be the spiritual ruler in the house. You're responsible. Verse 17, it's the same attitude. It's a Karen attitude. But we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth to burn incense unto the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her. As we have done, we and our fathers, our kings and our princes in the seas of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, for then had we plenty of victuals and were well and saw no evil. Saying, oh man, when we, were, when we were doing this, everything was going just fine. Great, Jeremiah, until you came along and started saying all this stuff. But since we left off to burn incense to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her, we have wanted all things and have been consumed by the storm and by the famine. They're saying, see, I mean, when we stop doing this, that's when all the bad things happened. And Jeremiah's going to set them straight. And it's, well, it says here, verse 19, And when we, when we burned incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings unto her, did we make her cakes to worship her and pour our drink offerings on her without our men? She's the women talking to Jeremiah and rebuking him and saying, well, oh, what do you think we did without our men? Who's the one in charge here? It's obviously the ladies. Now look, there's nothing inherently evil about women. So it's not like this is just, oh man, you know, but these women are evil. They're worshiping the, 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 the queen of heaven. That doesn't exist. And these men are just letting it happen. And I'm sorry, men. You know, you ought not to be these pushover husbands. Well, that's what the boss says. And I'm so sick of those jokes. Well, let me go ask the boss. You know what? I never laugh at those jokes, and I've never said, you know what? I'm the boss in my home. Amen. And, and people think I'm joking, and I'm like, I'm not joking. <laughs> I actually am the boss in my home. Because it's a shame when the man is not the boss in the home. And I think we've seen enough scripture to prove that. And Isaiah chapter 3 is saying, you know what? When women and children are ruling over you, you're cursed. You're cursed. And, you know, and for those of you that just think that my wife has it horrible because she lives with such a tyrannical dictator, you can ask her what it's like to be married to this monster and how horrible things are for her because I'm in charge at home. People don't understand at all. But you know what, Christians, you really ought to be striving. Ladies, put on that ornament of a meek and quiet spirit that is precious in the sight of God, like the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3. I was going to do this at the end, but I'm just going to do it right now because I'm going to have to wrap things up. The Bible says, likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. When you're running the show, when you're pulling the strings, when you're doing everything at home, you are not in subjection. You need to learn your place. And yeah, I know that sounds really rude, but everybody has a place, and we all need to learn our place. Everybody does. 
You need to learn the proper role that you have, whether it be dealing with internally with your family, whether it be dealing with other people and trying to usurp authority. You know what? The women aren't going to be the teachers. And you know, in no aspect of this church are the women going to be running things, by the way. Like with the music group, I was just talking to Brother Peter about this, that I appreciate his leadership. Because Peter is running the show when it comes to our music. Just like I'm running the show when it comes to the church overall, and I'm overseeing what Peter's doing with the music, you know what? Nobody's going to be telling everyone the way things are going to go inside of you know, anything that's being run in this church. And it has nothing to do with, with people just being real wicked or anything like that. I don't think there's nothing going on like that. But my point is, you know, we do have a lot of ladies who are involved in music here. But at the end of the day, Peter's the one running things. He's the one in that authority. And at the end of the day, I'm the one in authority in this church. And I'm the one in authority in my house, and all the men ought to be the ones in authority in their house. And you need to be the one that makes the decisions and, and determines the direction of your family. And the ladies ought to be the ones that are in subjection to their own husbands, like 1 Peter 3 says, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wise, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Who's adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold or putting on of apparel, not wanting to be the center of attention, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Meekness and quietness means you don't always need to give your opinion about everything. And it's not that your husband doesn't care about your opinion, but you know what? Let him lead. Let him lead. I'm not saying that you can't talk about things or anything like that. Of course you can talk about things. And of course your husband's going to love you and care about what you have to think and say and stuff. But at the same point, you know, when your husband's making decisions, you don't need to be second guessing him all the time. Yeah, amen. Yeah. Let him make the decisions, ladies. Have that meek and quiet spirit and say, okay, great. I'm supporting you. Because I was designed to be a help that was suitable for you. Because when God made woman, he made the woman out of a rib, out of the man, because the man needed a partner, because the man needed a support, and God wanted to find a partner for the man. And he made a woman to support the man, to have that role, to have that job, because that job can't be filled by any beast of the earth, by anything else at all than another human being, a human woman to have that great relationship, to have that support. But the support definitely goes from the woman to the man, not from the man to the woman. It's not that a, a husband can't help her wife, but you know what? The job of the wife is to help her husband. And we need to understand our roles. When you get married, you become one flesh, but the head is still the man of the house. And it should be one goal. It should be one family. It should be a union of one direction. When it starts splitting off, you have problems. So husbands have a very important job and a hard job of trying to lead and do all the right things for the whole family. And the wife has a hard job of trying to support everything that her husband's trying to do and just make sure that it all happens the way that it's supposed to happen, the way that he wants it to happen. It's simple. But you know what comes in the way? Pride. Pride. Pride comes in the way all the time. It's a pride. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to support my husband. And interestingly enough, we're going to finish off Isaiah 3 with guess what? Pride from the daughters of Israel. I'm not going to go deep into this because I already preached on this a couple weeks ago. Verse number 13, Isaiah chapter 3. The Bible says, The Lord standeth up to plead. Verse number 13. The Lord standeth up to plead and standeth to judge the people. The Lord will enter into judgment with the ancients of the people and the princes thereof. For you have eaten up the vineyard, the spoil of the poor is in your houses. What mean ye that ye beat my people to pieces and grind the faces of the poor, saith the Lord God of hosts. And this, I, I was going to preach more on this, but we're already getting over time. 
obviously this is crazy that, the, that this is the type of oppression and affliction that's going on in this society, that, that they're beating you know, my, God's people to pieces and they're grinding the face of the poor. There's just no, they don't care at all. But then look at verse 16. The Bible says, Moreover the Lord saith, Because the daughters of Zion are haughty, and walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go, and making a tinkling with their feet. Therefore the Lord will smite with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will discover their secret parts. God doesn't like that proud look, that lofty, haughty look, and that walking and that prancing and, and thinking that you're so special and you're all that and lifting yourself up. And not just that, when we start reading these verses, ask yourself, does this sound like modesty to you about how they're dressed? Because, look, modesty is not, we, we have a, one, only one view of modesty in general when people think of modesty. And that, that view or definition of modesty is correct, but that's not the only way to take it, right? So we tend to think of, of modesty, like it would be immodest if a woman is wearing like a really short skirt or like, like really exposing a lot of her chest that would be considered immodest. But why is it considered immodest? Why? It's because it's drawing attention to you. It's getting eyes focused on you. Now, the purpose of the eyes being, being you know, brought on you in that sense is because it's, it's appealing to the, to the fleshly desires of men and their lusts that's drawing their eyes to you. But there's other ways of drawing eyes and focus and attention on you. That is also immodest because you're not supposed to be putting yourself out there as having all eyes of me because you're supposed to have the meek and quiet spirit with shamefacedness and sobriety that's going to do your job humbly and meekly without being the center of attention, which is also why you're not going to be in charge and ruling over everything because you're not the center of attention because someone else is going to be, the man's going to be, and you're going to be there supporting them the whole time. And it's another extremely important job. And in order for that man to really be successful, they're going to need someone supporting them. And the more you can support them, the better they're going to be. Which means the better you're going to be. The better both of you are going to be because you should have the, be sharing the same goal anyways. But look as we keep reading here. Keep that modesty in mind. Verse 18, In that day the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about their feet and their calls and their round tires like the moon the chains and the bracelets and the mufflers, the bonnets and the ornaments of the legs and the headbands and the tablets and the earrings, the rings and nose jewels, the changeable suits of apparel and the mantles and the wimples and the crisping pins, the glasses and the fine linen and the hoods and the veils. You can see how you can have a lot of eyes focused on you even if you're not being revealing. Jewelry, sparkles, glitter, everything just, uh oh, wow, everybody look at me. That's immodest. Now, it doesn't mean you have to dress in the ugliest thing you could find. Because <laughs> that could also be immodest if you just dress in something really bizarre and really weird that, like, is just, just way out there. You're also going to be drawing attention to yourself. Just dress normal, right? And that normal is kind of hard to define because today's world, normal is probably not, uh, not the way that normal because they're normal, just cover yourself, right? Wear garments that are not revealing. Don't add a million accessories. I know everyone's going to be walking away going, ah, the crisping pins. I got to get rid of all my crisping pins now and my wimples. What am I going to do with all my wimples? I don't know what those are. So <laughs> I'm assuming that other people don't know. What, maybe you know what they are, and you're like, yeah, Pastor Rosen, I actually do know what those are. I haven't taken the time to look up every single one of these words because you get the idea, right? And if you have to have that round tire like the moon, just one for really special occasions. <laughs> but isn't it interesting, though, we see that, the you know, after all is said and done, it's that proud spirit. It's that pride that leads people away from doing what they're supposed to be doing. 
every time, that, that haughty spirit. Men and women both, right? But, but with the women being, being in submission, it's always a pride issue. It's always, it's always you, can't, you can't swallow that pride and do what someone else is telling you to do. And you know what? It's made harder because of the culture that we live in today, because American culture is promoting women to be completely independent of men. But you know what? That is completely against Scripture. Because the Scripture talks about the husband and the father being an authority in his household over his daughters until the day that he has the authority to, to cancel a vow that she's going to make and to give her away to another man to be, her hus to be her husband, who's then going to lead her and take care of her as the father took care of her all of her life, but now obviously it's a different relationship with father and wife, but the husband's still going to take care of her the rest of her days. God made women to be cared for. Hey, amen, why doesn't anyone want to look at that aspect? You're being cared for your whole life. Yeah, you have to care for them too, but, but God didn't want you going off and working and doing all these other things. When you're married, you need to be home and taking care of your family. And supporting your husband. That's the way God designed it. And that's why you leave father and mother. Bible says in verse 24, And it shall come to pass that instead of sweet smell, there shall be stink. And instead of a girdle, a rent. And instead of a well-set hair, baldness. And instead of a stomach or a girding of sackcloth. And burning instead of beauty. Thy men shall fall by the sword, and thy mighty men in the war, and her gates shall lament and mourn, and, sh and she being desolate shall sit upon the ground. That's the cursed nation. Women and children being in charge, leading. And then people, God's people even, not even realizing, you're already being judged. Wake up. Stand for righteousness. Don't tolerate the abominable people that are going to declare their sin in Sodom. And God forbid that it's happening in, in God's house, that people are so unashamed of their sin that they're just proclaiming it. Let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. Thank you for the great truth from Scripture. Lord, I pray that you please help us to battle the darkness every day, dear Lord. It uh, seems to be getting worse and worse. I pray that you please help us to be strengthened and encouraged and edified by one another. And that as our lives look more and more strange to this world, I pray that you please help us to be encouragement one to another and to just have a good testimony. And that, and that we would, um, through our actions as well as our words, be able to, to be a good witness unto the truth of your word, dear Lord. And I pray that you please help us to improve and to get the sins out of our life, that um, we, could, we could continually decrease our own hypocrisies where we're failings and our shortcomings, dear Lord, but that we can um, just be looked at as examples of the believers and that, that you would build our church and help us to grow and help us to reach more people, dear, dear God. And, and Lord, just, um, just work with us and through us to, uh, to, that your will would be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.